All right, we are into our last three chapters for this unit in chapter 18. We're going to talk a lot about what makes a pathogen a pathogen. Uh, in chapter 25, we will talk about medical diagnostic tests. So we wait that long to talk about it because we have to understand all of the concepts first to figure out how to apply them to a healthcare setting. And then finally, in chapter 26, we will talk a little bit about epidemiology, which is the study of uh, disease statistics, outbreaks, um, things like that, and working to prevent disease spread. Okay, so chapter 18, microbial pathogenesis. Um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, pathogenicity, the ability of a pathogen to cause disease, and we'll briefly touch on some of the genetic factors that lead to that. Um, spoiler alert, it's mainly horizontal gene transfer, as we've talked about previously. Um, we'll talk about the mechanisms, at least at a high level, that uh, microbes use to cause disease. And then we'll talk about different strategies they use to survive in a host. These often go hand in hand with causing disease. And finally, we'll look at some differences between viruses and bacteria. All right, let's start with a case study. This one, um, you may remember this if you're old enough, um, but uh, there were some other things happening in September 2001 that may uh, um, have preceded this. Um, so... We have Robert Stevens, he's uh, 63 years old, a photo editor uh, at a Florida tabloid newspaper. Um, he's about to go on vacation, but before he goes, someone asked him to examine this strange love letter to Jennifer Lopez uh, that they received. So he's like looking at it, seeing, is this real? What is this? You know, it's a tabloid. They're reporting on strange stuff, right? It turns out his coworker later said that when they opened the letter... It had this white powder inside of it that came out. Uh, they didn't really think anything of this, and they decided that the letter was a hoax, and they got rid of it. Eight days later, while he's on vacation, he starts feeling ill. He gets muscle ache, nausea, fever. Um, the symptoms go up and down over his, his trip. Um, this is very generic, right? So you don't think much of this. Um, but when he gets home, he's feverish, vomiting, and has mental confusion. So his wife takes him to the ER. This is uh, generally indicative of a larger scale infection, right? So when he gets there, his temperature is 102.2 Fahrenheit, so definitely in fever. Cerebrospinal fluid and blood are collected and looked at for microbes in there. The CSF, as we've seen, was cloudy when it should be clear, so there's some sort of uh, infection of the cerebrospinal fluid. They do lab reports, um, high protein levels in there, a normal glucose, white blood cell counts uh, are quite high as well in the CSF, so uh, definitely an infection. They're thinking this is broader though um, so they do an x-ray of his lungs and it shows that infiltrate the, the stuff we've seen in several chest x-rays where there's definitely uh, bacterial growth so both the csf and the blood cultures grow gram positive rods so unfortunately within a couple of hours of being admitted he has a grand mal seizure they have to intubate him to help him breathe and uh Three days later, basically, he's unresponsive. He has hypotension, so low blood pressure, um, goes into cardiac arrest, and dies despite attempts to resuscitate him. So, what's caused this? Well, this would be the first death in the 2001 uh, anthrax bioterrorism attacks. So, anthrax, Bacillus anthracis, is a bacteria... It is potentially a bioweapon. Um, Bacillus anthracis, in this case, in September of 2001, was sent through the U.S. mail system. The spores had been modified to allow them to float longer in the air. As a result of these attacks, five people died, 17 others were infected. Um, so what happens is these spores, they're inhaled. And remember, endospores are highly resistant, so uh, they were sent through the mail. Um, in response to this, we now have changed some male procedures. Some male is irradiated and things like this, but spores are highly resistant. Uh, 
So when the spores get inhaled, they go into the lungs and they germinate where they release toxins into the blood and get into the blood and cause septicemia and larger scale infection. So these toxins uh, are one of the things that causes the disease here and ultimately led to death. Um, who did this? Well, this is where things get weird. Uh, in September 2001, some other things happened, attacks on the World Trade Center. So originally investigators thought these might be linked to each other. Turns out they can't find any evidence of that. We ended up tracking it back to uh, a strain of Bacillus anthracis from a government biodefense lab. And they believe that uh, the culprit was a person named Bruce Ivins, who was a scientist there. Uh, while they were investigating this, um, he committed suicide. And so we don't know really if he acted alone. We think so. Um, we don't understand his motivation. Um, a lot of the letters had anti-U.S. rhetoric. Um that seem to indicate Islamic terrorists. Um, that might just be uh, some sort of red herring ploy. Uh, there was no evidence that he was involved with any of those groups. So, uh, scarily, it could be the lone actions of one crazy individual. And you might ask, why do we research uh, bioweapons? Well, the long and short of it is, is... Um, partly to potentially use them, although hopefully our government is no longer doing that. Um, more these days, hopefully it is to defend against them. Bioweapons, um, any sort of biological agent that can be weaponized, they, uh, obviously we have historical examples, right? Um, they used to chuck dead carcasses into besieged uh, cities and things like that in hopes of spreading disease. Um, Bioweapons tend to be hard to control, so they're very scary and uh, don't often work the way you think they will. As you can see, not everyone died from these things, but they did get um, infected. And uh, bioweapons tend to be uh, something that we think terrorists might be interested in because the goal of that is to spread fear. Not necessarily to kill as many people as possible, but to disrupt lives through fear. And bioweapons certainly do that. This case is declared closed, but there's lots of conspiracy theories out there and still unanswered questions, and uh, I think it will be a long time, if ever, that we really fully understand what's going on uh, in this case. So, how's that tie into this chapter? Well, obviously Bacillus anthracis is a microbe that can cause disease, but interestingly, it's very similar to a common soil microorganism that we could go out and probably find in soil uh, out, out here in Idaho. Bacillus cerus is a related species, uh, and it is not pathogenic. So why is Bacillus anthracis a potential killer, and Bacillus cerus is not? It is harmless. Well, some of this comes down to the genome. Bacillus anthracis has two plasmids, PXO1 and PXO2, that encode genes for a toxin and for capsules. Capsules are the sticky outer layers that allow uh, microbes to prevent phagocytosis from occurring. So uh, just a few small changes can make something deadly, or a few small changes can make it not deadly to humans. Um, this study is the study of what we call pathogenicity or pathogenesis, studying how microbes cause disease. We're gonna talk a little bit about what goes into making a pathogen at the genomic level. Um, a lot of this has to do with horizontal gene transfer. We're not gonna to go too deep into this, so don't worry, but we will talk in preceding sections about some uh, actual mechanisms of how microbes can cause disease, which I think is really interesting, right? We know they can cause disease, but how do they actually do it? Okay, so what makes a pathogen? Well, the process by which a pathogen causes disease is known as pathogenesis. There are five steps to pathogenesis. I would like you to know these for a test. Number one, the pathogen has to enter the host, right? Otherwise, no infection happens. So that's, that's step number one. 
Once it gets into the host, it needs to attach and colonize that host. It needs to attach to the surface and start growing. You might not think about it, but a lot of the processes of your body are designed to push things out, get mics, microbes out, right? Coughing, sneezing, uh, the peristaltic motion of your gut, uh, the strong flow of urine out of the bladder and the urethra. All of these things could wash away potential microbes unless they attach to the body's surfaces. Once they're in there and growing, as we know, humans have a robust immune system. Successful pathogens, which means things that are good at causing disease, right? They're successful at that. They're not great for us. Um, they need to avoid the host immune system. So they have very clever tricks to do this. We'll see some very dastardly things that microbes can do. Once they're in there, they generally cause host damage. Uh, they don't do this just for fun. A lot of microbes cause host damage uh, to degrade the immune system, to get nutrients, to uh, get dispersed throughout the organism, and then to be uh, go on to the last step, which is exit from the host. So we think about something like diarrhea. Diarrhea is a dispersal mechanism for many bacteria. We'll talk about cholera uh, again. So what does this? Well, pathogens have things that we call virulence factors. These uh, help pathogens do all of these steps, help them get in, help them disturb host functions, enable transmission to new hosts. Virulence factors are the things that uh, allow these processes to happen here. So what are some examples of this? Well, pili, remember those long appendages? Uh, pili are great virulence factors because they allow microbes to attach to the host. They can grab on. We'll see a couple different types of these. They might make enzymes that harm the host or prevent detection, uh, degrade the immune system. Uh, proteins that can disrupt normal cellular functions or even reprogram host cells uh, to cause them to uh, go through programmed cell death. So there are microbes that basically cause uh, cells of the immune system to kill themselves, uh, leading to avoidance of the immune system. Things like this, uh, there are microbes that uh, cause cells to reproduce to help them spread. Um, capsules are sticky outer coatings that many microbes make that helps them avoid that process of phagocytosis. The phagocyte actually can't grab onto the microbes, so it basically slippery outer coating. And then we've talked about this one, enzymes that inactivate antibiotics, right? Uh, destroying defenses here. Um... We'll see uh, several examples of these. Uh, we'll talk about things like specifically like Staphylococcus aureus makes this gene called coagulase, which like coats the microbe and helps prevent inflammation. So it like hides it from the immune system, which can make it very difficult to treat. These factors, these virulence factors, they're all encoded in genes in the genome. Interestingly, they're not generally randomly dispersed we tend to see regions of the genome that contain large amounts of virulence factors. We call these pathogenicity islands. Um, this is a genomic region that contains the genes for virulence factors. And they're often clumped together, and many times we notice that we think they're acquired from horizontal gene transfer. So remember, horizontal gene transfer was one microbe species can give another microbe species uh, several genes. Oftentimes, this happens in the case of plasmids, but it can also be bits of the genome. So how do we know this? Well, what we look for are the genomic islands, the pathogenicity islands. And to detect these, um, generally we look for patterns. So E. coli's genome is about 50% G and C and 50% A and T on whole. But we find regions of the genome that have very different GC content in them. Here you can see it drops down to about only 40% Gs and Cs, whereas it would be 60% A and T. This whole region having that kind of structure is weird, right? Like, why does it just suddenly drop off? It's not gradual, it just suddenly drops off. This leads us to believe that this region here, this pathogenicity island, which contains all kinds of genes that cause pathogenesis, we think that's been acquired horizontally. So uh, another microbe has donated parts of its genetic material to, uh, in this case, E. coli. 
We also often find uh, repetitive sequences at the ends of these regions that look like phage or plasmid uh, sequence that may have helped them move into this location. So uh, this is one way that we go about detecting it. Obviously, the more genomes we sequence, the more we say, hey, this gene over here, uh, we find that in this pathogenic E. coli. Like maybe they swapped bits. So this is where our idea of a tree of life in microbes doesn't always work out. It's more like a web of life. Uh, microbes are donating bits of genetic material back and forth. So a uh, disease that you might be familiar with, the Black Death or the plague caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis, which we've talked about previously, it has plasmids that contain toxin genes. Uh, on this plasmid, PMT1, we have a murine toxin and a capsule gene in there. So when I was doing some postdoctoral work studying Yersinia pestis, I did not work with the infectious version of the microbe. We worked with a version that was missing these key plasmids, so it couldn't cause disease in us, so we didn't have to work in, in a special uh, laboratories to work on it. So just taking out little bits of DNA can completely change how a microbe functions. Okay, that's our super high level of pathogen evolution, right? Uh, a lot of times we recognize these genomic islands, these pathogenicity islands that encode the virulence factors. Remember, the virulence factors are proteins that enhance an organism's uh, disease-causing ability. Uh, and microbes, again, don't cause disease for fun. Usually they're doing it to enhance transmission or growth or things like this. So um, all of these factors play in. All right, that's it for 18.1.